This evening, we'd like to continue with what we have talked about the last couple of times. We have looked at uh, nine things that deal with what we must do. And uh, tonight, we're going to talk about some things we must not do. Now, uh, as we talked last uh, Sunday morning about this subject, we looked at the uh, Greek verb uh, deo, which is usually translated must. This must be done. This ought to be done. Uh, and that word is used once on the other side of must not in one passage, but the, the other two, it's simply a translation of the verb. And uh, a couple of translations uh, have let it not be this way, but the English Standard and the New American Standard use must not. So it's still translated must not, sometimes even when it's not that precise verb because there's another construction that indicates the same thing. But we would like to look at some uh, passages tonight, one was just read for us, concerning things that we must not be associated with. And uh, the first one of these comes from the passage, Ephesians 5. We'll be there looking at some of these things this evening for a little while. The first one is fornication or sexual immorality, which was as common in the first century as it is today. So whether in the form of unmarrieds being together in an intimate way, or whether it is adultery or homosexuality, which is included in the word fornication, uh, fornication in the first century was a highly practiced. In other words, there, until Christianity came along, there was no real attempt to curb these things, uh, for people to avoid these things. Uh, the change came with Christianity, which now upheld and practiced moral teaching. Fornication was even incorporated into religious rites. Uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, Baal worship and some of the other uh, idols of the various uh, nations in the land of Canaan, why it was so popular, because it involved uh, this type of, of situation which apparently appealed to a lot of people more than the purity of Jehovah's teaching. Now in the New Testament, we have a lengthy passage concerning this. Let's turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to come back to Ephesians 5 in a few moments. But let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 13. Beginning with verse 13. 13. <clears throat> foods for the stomach and stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now you might think, what does that have to do with anything? Paul is turning some of the argumentation that people make to try to justify immorality back upon them. And uh, so some might make the argument that males and females are made for each other. And Paul responds by saying, okay, but God is not for immorality. There is a legitimate expression of that kind of intimacy, but it is not with anyone at any particular time that is convenient. So going back to uh, verse 13, 
uh, picking up where we left off. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. That's the way God intended it within marriage, but it occurs in one physical sense, even if the two are not married. But uh, he who is joined to the Lord, verse 17, is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, you might think that uh, this is a, an unusual exhortation to Christians, You might think Christians would know this. You might think that Christians would have been taught on this subject. And yet, the pressures of the world and the pressures of false religion were so great that apparently this needed to be taught to Christians. Remember that in Corinth, there were 1,000, quote, priestesses who walked the streets at night looking for sexual partners. 1,000 in the city of Corinth. And that was just one way to be immoral. And so the temptation was tremendous, multifaceted on every side, and thus... Apparently, some Christians were giving in to this temptation and needed to thus be exhorted uh, to abstain from sexual immorality and to flee fornication. So that is what we find later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 8. Paul says, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, talking about an incident in Israel, and in one day fell 23,000. Now that's the one passage where the, the, the verb deo is actually used. The other comes from translation, but must not is actually there, literally, verbally, in that verse. Well, what is Paul referring to in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 8. Remember the book of Numbers. Remember the incident in which Balaam, although he could not curse God or Israel, found a way to get Israel cursed by suggesting what? That the women of Moab entice sexually the men of Israel. And that's why these thousands died because they gave in to the temptation. Paul is saying, don't be like those men and stand against fornication, flee fornication. It must not be named among you. And so that's the first one from, first, or from Ephesians chapter 5 that we want to look at this evening. Let's go to the second one then, which is not unrelated. Uncleanness is something that Christians must avoid. Uh, 
going back to Ephesians chapter 5, we read, But fornication should not be named among you, but neither should uncleanness. That's the second word in the list. This is the opposite of trying to make oneself pure. This is the opposite, uncleanness. It's the same word that is found in Romans chapter 1, verse 24, where Paul is writing <clears throat> concerning those who had departed from God after the flood and uh, changed the incorruptible God into images like um, a man, four birds, four-footed animals, and so on. And then verse 24 says, Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness. This is the very thing Paul is saying to avoid in Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, but notice how he then developed that point in Romans chapter 1 verse 24. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust toward one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. So that is the type of uncleanness then that we find in Romans chapter 1, sexual uncleanness in whatever form it might have taken. So that is the second one that we read of in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 3. The third one is covetousness. Now, Generally, we think of a covetous person as one that has placed money above all else. But it's interesting that in this passage, we find nothing else along those lines. Everything else in this passage has to do with fornication. Uh, is it possible that this one has to do with fornication. Not somebody who is covetous with money, but is covetous in sexual terms. You might say, well, that sounds strange. Well, no, not really. Go back to Exodus chapter 20 in the Ten Commandments that God gave to Israel and notice the tenth one. What does he say? You shall not covet your neighbor's house you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Now, all the rest of those have to do with property. But that one definitely relates to fornication. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Well, I don't know that we have to say this is one way or the other. A covetous person, whether it's related to fornication or related to wealth, is still wrong. And it is something that must not be done by Christians. Uh, let's go to the rest of that verse in Ephesians chapter 5 and uh, verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not, <coughs> excuse me, let it not be named among you as is fitting for saints. What is fitting? According to strong, is to be suitable or proper. It's not proper. It's not fitting. It's not appropriate for these things to be named 
among Christians. And we, we find that elsewhere in uh, the New Testament, the, uh, speaking of appropriateness. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10, after having uh, said how women ought not to be dressed and uh, adorned, he says, but which is proper for winning, uh, women, same thing, what is fitting, what is appropriate, but which is proper for women professing godliness, let, let them be clothed with good works. Another passage is Titus chapter 2 and verse 1, uses the same word uh, concerning fitting. Uh, but as for you, speak the things which are proper or befitting sound doctrine. Preachers have a responsibility not to preach themselves, not to preach uh, stories, but to preach the word. That is what is fitting. That is what is appropriate. And uh, sad to say, there are many places that if you were traveling, you could visit where you would not get an appropriate, proper sermon. Uh, but that is the admonition that Paul gave to Titus. So there are things that God regards as fitting, as appropriate, as proper. But these things he has listed in Ephesians 5, 3 are not. These are not proper. These are not fitting. These are not appropriate. Well, let's go on from uh, there then, going back to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, he adds a few more to the list. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting which are not fitting. So that idea is, a, is a repeated. Well, what is filthiness? Something that is shameful, something that could be obscene. Other words that uh, are in this family of words that is defined as filthiness relate to shame. For example, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18. As uh, the letter is being written to the Laodiceans, he says, I counsel you to buy gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. The conduct of those in Laodicea was shameful. And that's uh, related to the same word we're looking at here in Ephesians chapter 5. Let's go on to the next phrase, that of foolish talking. This comes from two Greek words meaning to speak and a fool. In fact, uh, this compound word, part of that is moros, from which we get the word moron. And so we should not be speaking as a fool. We should not be talking as a moron. That's the idea that is being communicated uh, in this particular passage. Foolish talking. Christians must not talk in this way. Then we come to number six, which is coarse jesting. Now, the Greek word here can refer to something that is innocent, innocent humor or witty repartee. In this particular cartoon, uh, the husband and wife are always at each other's throats. And uh, they have some excellent cartoons that can be used in marriage counseling on how not to behave. But in this particular one, he's looking at the moon and he tells his wife, look at the full moon tonight. I almost, you can almost hear your mother howling. Well, that's uh, not coarse, but it is jesting. That is, uh, unless he's serious, of course. 
But uh, this kind of thing is not necessarily condemned, but the lower aspect of it is. We uh, saw a movie recently in which two women were talking, and they were anticipating uh, that royalty were going to be in their presence shortly. And one woman said to the other, will you have enough cliches to get you through the visit? And the other one responded by saying, well, if not, I'll come to you. Well, this is, you know, uh, kind of going at each other in a uh, sort of polite way. And that is a legitimate usage of, of uh, the word, but coarse jesting suggests something altogether different. Coarse jesting has this bad sense, scurrility, ribaldry, low jesting. Shakespeare, for all of his brilliance, uses this kind of low humor rather frequently. There are six words then that we have looked at that we ought to avoid these types of things. These things should not be named. We must not do these things as Christians. But in their place, there is one positive thing that is suggested, and that is giving of thanks. Don't be doing these types of things. Don't be saying these types of things, but rather let your words involve giving of thanks. Now, there is uh, another passage we want to consider, and that would be 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. All of these have come from um, Ephesians 5. But in 2 Timothy and verse 24, we see that there is something else we must not do. And that is that we may, must not be quarrelsome. Uh, Second uh, Timothy 2.24 reads, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. So in place of the one thing we are not to do, we have three things that it would be good to do. But we should not be quarrelsome. According to Strong, this refers to armed combatants or those who engage in a war of words to quarrel, wrangle, dispute. This does not refer to making an argument, however, uh, a person can be argumentative and quarrelsome and never make an actual argument for someone to consider. Presenting an argument is not bad, but being argumentative is. So reasoning or disputing upon a, a hypothesis uh, or discussing an idea and, and going back and forth concerning it, that's not necessarily quarrelsome. It could be, depending on one's attitude. But that is actually often very helpful. Paul reasoned with people in the synagogue. Paul disputed with them. What he did was not wrong. But he did it in the proper manner. And there is an improper manner that we ought to avoid, uh, and that is being pugnacious, ready to fight despite the evidence. You may have seen some people that could not wait for you to finish the sentence before they jumped in with both feet and tried to trample all over you. They hadn't listened to the evidence. They hadn't looked at the evidence. They were argumentative. That's the kind of thing we are to avoid. And such an attitude is to be replaced by a gentle attitude. Someone might say, as you look at this verse and what a servant of the Lord ought to be, someone might say that Paul is talking about a preacher. Uh, 
since uh, Timothy was a preacher as a servant of the Lord. Is that right? Is that what he's talking about? Are we not all servants of the Lord? Well, but he writes that the servant of the Lord must be able to teach. Yes, he does. Is that only for a select few? What about Hebrews 5.12? For, for the time you ought to be what? Teachers. Who are you writing to? Author of Hebrews. To Christians. To brethren. Not to preachers. Not to elders. But to all the saints. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again concerning the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have need not of, uh, of milk, rather than strong meat. And must we not all be gentle? Must we not all learn to be patient? And so I'm not uh, quite willing to give up First, uh, 2 Timothy 2.24 is something that only applies to uh, preachers. It seems that it would apply to each and every one of us. So then, there are some things that the Christian must not do. Commit fornication in any one of the types that is uh, part of the definition. Not be guilty of uncleanness, but rather purity of uh, thought and mind and behavior. Not be covetous, whether sexual or financial. For engage in filthiness. We must not engage in filthiness. Or engage in foolish talking. Or engage in coarse jesting. Some jesting is okay, uh, provided it doesn't reach this level. But not certainly not coarse jesting, not being quarrelsome. We may discuss something with someone. We may present an argument. That's not necessarily being argumentative. That's not necessarily being quarrelsome. We need to avoid having this type of attitude in any discussion that we have with someone concerning religious matters. Imagine how uh, seeing a Christian doing one of these seven things, imagine the impact that that will have on the world. Imagine how that will impair the Christian example and cause somebody in the world not to want to be a child of God. Many might reply in seeing these kinds of things, they might reply, well, what's different about a Christian? They behave the same way we do. They act the same way we do. What is there in Christianity that is different than the way we behave? And uh, so we need to keep Matthew chapter uh, 5, verses 14 through 16 in mind. We are uh, a light... And a city that is set on a hill, uh, you, can't, you can't hide it. You can't put your light under uh, a bushel so that nobody sees it. You can't try to obscure it by acting in these uh, illicit ways of behavior. So these are things that Christians must not do. Everyone here is either a Christian or not. If you have obeyed the gospel, that is tremendous. If you have not and you don't know what to do, we haven't dwelt on that, but please ask us before you leave. Uh, we'll just briefly mention that everyone who is not a Christian needs to come to a knowledge of the truth, repent of sins, uh, confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and, and know what that means, and then be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. The Lord will then add you to the church, the body of Christ. 
So if you have already done that, that is good, but there's two things. One is becoming a Christian. The other is behaving as a Christian. We must not do these things. There are some musts that we ought to be doing, but these are the things we ought not to be doing that we've discussed this evening. So if we can help you to become a child of God, let us know. We'll be glad to do that right now or discuss it with you further. If you have not been behaving as a child of God, you need to repent. And if we can help you in that, let us know what we can do while we stand and while we sing.